here we are. Good afternoon. This is Liberal Arts MBA, a show where we highlight stories of people who led their own journeys through education and their career, through college and business. I'm Jacob Sager. I'm coming to you live from Phoenix, Arizona, where I'm visiting my wonderful uh, in-laws. And I actually have this house to myself. And I guess when the show's over, I'm just going to fold laundry. Questioning what you do with all your time, Jacob. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, I'm Sarah Sands. I am coming to you live again from the great state of Texas, from the wonderful city of Houston. Um, and today I am questioning the value of unlimited choice after struggling to decide on a sauce for wings last night, um, which it turns out when you have 18 options on a menu, there is a chance for it to be a little overwhelming. And we have our guest here today. Josh, do you want to introduce yourself and what you're questioning right now? Sure. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, Joshua Elder, based here in New York City. Probably can hear the sirens of the lovely city ambiance. I am questioning the value of joy, uh, deciding if I'm going to bring myself joy and just have a relaxing night on the couch after work or run the 10 miles I need to run for my marathon training program. Oh. I, at one point, tried to run. I go through stages of thinking that I should be a runner. Um, and at one point, like, you're supposed to experience that runner's high at, like, I don't know, three miles or whatever. I was, like, doing nine miles at one point, and there was no joy. I wanted to die the whole time. I was like, people choose to do this regularly for fun. And honestly, that feels masochistic to me. Yeah, that's, that's a weird way to exercise your freedom, putting yourself through so much pain. See, I, I just run every once in a while, and um, that's enough. Jacob, you run after four children daily, uh, <laughs> so I think I think that you get your running in. Whereas, like, I just run circles in my mind all the right. time. I got I got rid of the Fitbit because it was a joke. How many steps <laughs> I had? <laughs> um. Well, welcome, Jacob. Talk us through a little bit. What are we doing here today? So we are, thank you for joining us. This is episode four. We are in our fourth episode of Liberal Arts MBA, the live stream show. We're coming live to you from my LinkedIn profile, our YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook page. So if you're watching this right now as we're live or in the future, you are in one of those locations um, and you can follow us on any of those places. We would really like you on LinkedIn specifically to follow our liberal arts MBA page, as well as to connect with Sarah on her professional profile. Once both of those reach a thousand followers, they can request to go live and um, the impact of these conversations can go broader. So we would like for you to follow Sarah and follow this page on LinkedIn, but also like it on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, Bing, bing, you know, don't forget to click like. Follow us on Twitter. We have a brand new Twitter. It needs some followers. So uh, what is this? We want to talk to Josh today. Josh is what we're all about. It, but let's get some things out of the way so we can say we did the liberal arts and we did the NBA. We're going to give you a nugget of both to just say we did it. So, so Sarah, why don't you give us the liberal arts piece so here? As you know, Jacob and I are like of the nerdy variety, which is why we have decided that you need a little bit of liberal arts and a little bit of business magic at the beginning of each of these shows. Um, so today, in honor of my Zadie, I am bringing you a quote from the essay on self-reliance by Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, and the quote from this literature segment um, is to believe your own thought to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. Speak your latent conviction and it shall be the universal sense. And I'm sure today that Emerson and Josh are actually in deep conversation with each other on speaking their conviction and their universal sense and truth into the world. That's, that's, that's some good stuff there. Make it liberal arts, we pick something out of a book and we're, we're going to explore it and relate it to what we're talking about. So I'm going to get into this uh, MBA tidbit here so we can say, you know, that we did the MBA piece. So uh, in business school, people usually look at case studies of leaders as well as looking at case studies of business entities. So today I'd like to talk about 
one of my favorite leaders in American civic society in a lot of different ways, and that's Dwight Eisenhower, the famous president who spoke up against the military industrial complex, having been a leader in such an institution and made a point to uh, kind of separate NASA and give a space for science as far as space. It was independent of the military entities. But the thing about him that's really great is that he pivoted so many times in his career and was striving to be a bigger person. I mean, he went from being the lead general of the Allied forces in World War II to coming to be the uh, president of Columbia University and was called out of that from his party at a time that people could work with that party um, to be president of the United States and was just a badass the whole way. And that's, I think, uh, an energy where... Yeah, so I think that energy today is what we're bringing. Uh, Josh and I both, well, Josh got that Columbia paper. I'm hopeful that I'm getting that Columbia paper. But I think like Eisenhower represents like the greatness in all of us to be multiple things within our lives and to follow different paths. And like also, when was the last time a Republican did something good for education? I don't know. So a little shout out to Eisenhower for bringing some good, good Republicans to the table in support of higher education. Um, so if you're here right now, we want to thank you again, um, our lovely audience. Um, and, you know, Jacob and I have talked about this a lot, giving people permission in this space to tell their own stories, the who, the what, the where, and the how. Part of this show is about exploring all the questions that we asked or didn't ask ourselves while we were writing our own stories and giving ourselves permission to better understand ourselves. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, into introducing our guest right now. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of formally introducing Josh Elder, expert asker of questions and our second guest to the show. Um, so thank you, Josh, for being brave and being number two. Um, as with every episode, starting out with a few stats, Josh has a bachelor's of science in liberal studies with concentrations in kindergarten through eighth grade science and history. He's got a master's in counseling education from Virginia Commonwealth University and a master's in public administration with a focus in urban and social policy from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. He's the current director of grants management at the Siegel Family Endowment, which is a private family foundation based in New York City. Um, and he's previously an educator. Most importantly, Josh is an inspiring human with an ability to ask questions and for me, I've had the opportunity of working on with Josh on many projects, and he has just an innate sense of being able to identify the pivotal junctures of these really intractable problems in a way that I both admire and envy and try to replicate. Um, from the time that I've met him, I've been moved by his calm demeanor in the face of immense challenges, his ability to parse problems in a way that allows everyone in the room to clarify the key questions and plot a path to answers. Um, and I think as Josh tells his story today that you at home will come to understand where Josh's ability to like really get down to the essential questions comes from. Um, so Josh, welcome officially to the show. Thank you. I am glad this is being recorded because that's such a generous and kind introduction that I'll just have to replay whenever I'm feeling a bit down. So excited right. to be the second guest here. It's your video business card. It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just send it to people as you're like applying for <laughs> jobs again or whatever it is you're doing in life. Be like, my friend says I'm amazing. Um, and it's true, I mean it. And um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Jacob right now, now that I've given that little intro. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to add to that in which when we talked to you preparing for this interview, uh, one thing I noticed was that is we went through the different parts of uh, your story that sometimes you'd frame things as the question here is, or in some words in that way, and I asked you if that was uh, related to being a science teacher at all. Um, and so I want to talk to you about going to school to be a teacher. Like you had immense clarity in going to undergraduate school, getting a degree in um, education from, uh, from your school. And I want to ask, like, how did you foster and create that clarity? And, and like, who, who were your influences, you know? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll paint the context for you. So grew up in rural Virginia, a small town with a population of less than a thousand. 
uh, technically a two stoplight town, even though the two stoplights are actually conjoined, so it's really one, but I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, and uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, graduated, also to give context, graduated with 30 people, 30 or 35 people in my senior class. So we're talking extremely small. But I knew early on for some weird reason as a, I can remember back in seventh grade, wanting to like be an educator. Um, and a lot of that, as I reflected on this, and I've had some opportunities to like talk about this was just due to the connection that you do get when you're in small town America with your teachers, right? Like they are there, they are committed to you. You don't have to deal with so many external factors. And I really just bonded with most of my teachers, especially in middle school and high school, and especially having the opportunity to have male teachers. Um, although they weren't males of color, they were male teachers, which is still a bit of anomaly in the, the education profession. But I kind of realized early on, I wanted to kind of almost role model myself after them in terms of the connection I had with them, the joy and the passion that I had, especially in science. And I think that's why the science teaching piece came about because my science teachers were probably the teachers I connected with the most. Mm. Um, and it was just like, again, really weird that a little seventh grader was like, I wanna be a teacher. And everyone's like, you know, you're gonna be broke, but you'll have the entire summer off. So I guess it kind of balances each other out. And as a seventh grader, you're like, sure, that sounds great. I don't know what that means, but let's let's roll with that. Man, I so I have told Jacob previously that we are we are eventually going to do a whole series on teachers and treat and teacher preparation and how we encourage or don't encourage people and like i i can't get over i mean i can easily believe it but that you know people literally encouraged you not to become a teacher but you had such a formative experience identifying with your male teachers we know that there's such a dearth of men of color so it's not surprising for me to hear that they were not there for you but that you had these male teachers who were in these dual roles and you stuck to that and stuck to your guns, even though people encouraged you not to. Um, so you finish school while you decide to go to a liberal arts college um, you go to Longwood University and then you decide based on your experiences that you're going to be a middle school teacher, science teacher in a public school in Richmond, Virginia. How did you decide that you wanted to do public school, that you wanted to go to Richmond, an urban area, when you had been like this rural country boy kid? And what was that experience like? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that, in terms of thinking about where I wanted to teach, I think it was because after I had graduated, I was like, my suitcase was packed counting down to like the day I could move out and go to college. But yet I picked a small school. Longwood, which most people have never heard of. It's in Farmville, Virginia. So the name of the town alone says enough. But <laughs> we did host a vice presidential debate back in, I guess that was 2016. So that's like the big claim to fame. Um, but because I then went to school in another small town where like the excitement was to go to Walmart on the town bus, um, I was like, okay, enough is enough. I've got to get into kind of urban life and civilization. So knew early on that I wanted to go to Richmond, which was kind of the, the closest biggest city. It was about two hours away from DC. Um, had no idea what that was gonna be like. Not even sure if I had ever been to Richmond, maybe once or twice to go to the big mall, um, but just knew I wanted to get out. And so for me, as I was thinking about this um, kind of sophomore, junior year and started going to the job fairs, I just narrowed down kind of the, the locations of where I wanted to be, but also this kind of, passion for me emerged around like I want to really challenge myself and kind of be in schools where probably most people don't want to go. So in Richmond, there's kind of the, the two sides of town. There's like the West End where it's highly resourced and a lot of people want to be there to both work and live. And then there's the East End that has just been historically disadvantaged, marginalized, not a lot of resources. And I was like, I want to go there. Like that's where I want to have my impact. I don't want to be a savior, but I know that's where I need to be. Um, for the learning and kind of my next steps of the journey. Super fortunate that because I said that, um, uh, being a black male, teaching science, wanting to go to what people would say, quote unquote, some of the, the worst schools out there, I ended up getting signed uh, a signing bonus, which is so weird, um, to get a signing bonus your junior year. I hadn't even done student teaching, 
but Triple basically, threat. Like, they, they, they had to give it to you. Exactly. Like talk about being like a sports star. Um, but yeah, <laughs> signed up and I mean, just having that comfort to say, okay, I know where I'm going to be. I know what I'm going to, I'm going to teach, had no idea what was going to be in store for me. I'm all happy go lucky, had no idea what I've actually signed myself up for, uh, for that first year of teaching there, but really excited that I knew that's where I wanted to be and was yeah. glad I made that choice so early on. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, one, all you teacher recruitment organizations out there signing bonuses, signing bonuses. Um, but then also like, so you didn't know what it was gonna be like for you out there, how you had this like traditional preparation mm -hmm. in teacher, education, uh, how did that translate to the experience that you had in this school? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a preface. I'll shout out Longwood. I'll shout out my professors because I saw a few of them liked uh, the post on Facebook. However, I will be very honest, I loved my program, the traditional certification. I felt prepared. I thought I was ready to go, super excited. Bought all my stuff at the teacher supply stores, did everything textbook, was ready for that first day of school. But honestly, nothing prepares you for your first day of school yeah. at 21 years old when that door shuts and it's just you and the 30 students that are eighth graders looking back at you, like, bring it on. We're used to this. Like, you're going to last probably a month and then we'll have a new teacher. So everything that I did for those four years went out the window to be completely honest. Um, I Those kids definitely like went in and gave everything back to me. Um, I did my traditional stuff that I was taught in classroom management and all the textbook stuff, but that stuff didn't work. Um, so it was, I remember that first day of school, I'll always remember it. I mean, within five minutes, I ran across the hall uh, to the other teacher who happened to also go to Longwood. She had graduated uh, a few years before me. And I was like, I can't do this. Like they didn't tell me about this. This is not what I signed up for. And I was like, I can't do it. Um, needless to say, I stayed there for many more years, but it was definitely a reality check of what traditional cert education programs don't necessarily prepare you for. Even if you go through student teaching and all those different experiences, it was very different. But I wouldn't change it uh, because I also learned a lot having to, to reteach myself on what it meant to be a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And you had an opportunity to kind of reteach yourself again, from what I recall. So you went from the traditional public school system, having done a traditional teacher prep program, and then you move to Philadelphia and you switched from traditional public schools. You went to KIPP, Knowledge is Power, uh, a charter school in inner city Philly, if I recall. Yeah. How did you decide to make that transition? What was that like? Yeah, so here's the, the naive country boy again, thinking, oh great, I got this, I did four years in Richmond, was starting to get comfortable, thought I was going to maybe go into school counseling, went to grad school, thought I'd do maybe administration, uh, and then had uh, the, the opportunity um, with the person that I was with at the time, uh, was headed to medical school in Philadelphia. And so had to think about, okay, what does that mean for me? What about my career? And had an amazing principal at the time who was so open uh, to me saying, look, it looks like I'm gonna leave. What do you think I should do? And she had just went to a conference and had learned about KIPP. Um, and she was like, you need to check this place out. Um, and again, being someone that's been so blessed and fortunate about timing, I look it up. I find that there is a KIPP school in Philly. It was only one at the time. I contact them. They actually respond back, which is surprising. At the time, their only science teacher was leaving to go into administration. So they had an opening. And it was just like this serendipitous, uh, um, just perfect like timing for me. And so packed my bags, moved to Philly, was naive and thinking that, you know what? I did four years in Richmond. I got this. Philadelphia is just going to be the same. Um, I mean, I watch Fresh Prince. Like, I, I know what it was like in West Philadelphia, <laughs> born and raised, right? No. Um, another reality check. Not only do I have to basically throw out all the traditional ways of teaching that I've just mastered for four years, because yeah. the charter school world, for those of you know, is just, it's such a different environment. 
Um, and the teaching is just on such a different level in terms of how they actually treat the, the sport of teaching and the impact that you want to have on your students. Having to learn that, having to navigate and learn the challenges that my students have experienced in North Philadelphia, for any of you out there that know about that, is an extremely challenging place. And yeah, just had to relearn and throw a lot out the window and be open to being very humble and say, you know what, even though this is my fifth year of teaching, I'm actually a first year teacher all over again because I need to relearn what it's like and really understand my students from where they're coming from. Can you share more about that, about that relearning? Because it's, it's sounding like to me that there are actually like two things that you had to relearn here in a sense. One of them was like, like how to teach science and how to teach what you loved in this totally different environment where for those of you who are less familiar with the traditional public school charter school divide, charter schools aren't always uh, held accountable in the same sort of test, standardized test that traditional public schools have to report on. Um, so teaching can look very different. And it also sounds like there was like some identity uh, questions that were coming up for you here and relearning like this student population and the context they were in. Can you talk more about those two things? Yeah, I'll start with the teaching because that's easier versus identity. Uh, we could be here all day about that. But from the <laughs> teaching standpoint, when I was teaching in Virginia, a lot of the kind of impact on teaching was focused on standardized testing. So the, the standards of learning or the SOLs. And so there's a lot of pressure in terms of making sure you're setting your students up for success to be able to score well on that. And you're very scripted in terms of the, the content and the curriculum that you're going to teach, even in a, a domain like science. When I got to KIPP, being that it's a charter school world and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania had slightly different standards, I actually was able to kind of like break away from that. So being that I was in science, a discipline that wasn't as restricted and confined to certain standards, I was actually able to, which is much harder, to say, you know what, what's important for kids to know about science, especially in seventh and eighth grade? It's much easier to say, this is your curriculum, don't stray from it, teach this, that, which is mo mostly rote memorization, it's much harder to say, what do you think kids need to know about science to get them excited to possibly pursue science later on in their career? So was really fortunate to be in uh, the science field to just think about how do I get these kids excited to come into the science lab every day? How do we make sure science isn't about what's in their textbook, but science is like what you actually do experiment, make mistakes, learn from them, test out these big questions to see what's going to happen. And so being at KIPP really allowed me to do that with a lot of instructional coaching and development, uh, because one thing you will notice a lot in the charter world is there's a big emphasis on support and development for teachers. It's very rigorous. You're on your instructional development plans to not only have a greater impact on your students, but they're trying to take you to your next level in terms of your teaching career. So it was a lot of unlearning, but there was a lot of support and structure there to help you be able to, to really live by the ethos uh, and the vision and the, the mission of what that school was about. So that was the, the teaching piece. The identity piece, um, that's where this kind of theme of like also unlearning and being a bit naive was in Richmond, I again had picked a location where I wanted to teach and it was pre predominantly a black and brown population. Moving to North Philly, I thought, you know what, as a person of color, I move into North Philly, I know this is again, a predominantly black and brown community. I'm probably gonna be able to connect with my students. Little did I know, and I guess I forgot, like, wait a minute, check yourself. You grew up in the country. Um, uh, again, with one stoplight, you did not grow up in the city, especially in North Philadelphia. So your understanding and your context and your background is so different uh, than uh, what these kids have uh, went from or, or grown up in. And so mm -hmm. the first year, I'll be very honest, I kind of skipped through that and thought that I didn't need to like unlearn and relearn kind of where my kids were coming from. And it wasn't until I had some really brutally honest conversations with a lot of my black male students that said, look, you're probably going to be gone in a year. So why are we going to invest our time in you? And you haven't even like thought about investing time in us other than what you're giving us in the classroom. Mm -hmm. and those conversations with those young men changed the shape 
of my experience and the time that I had there in my remaining years to really say, you know what? It's not so much about the teaching. It's now I need to like, it's all about my students, getting to know them and understanding them. And that was what those next few years were about as I kind of did different things and was moving into leadership. It was really student centered in the fact that my students were first, everything else came secondary. Yeah, I think, you know, we want to get to the rest of your journey. Um, but for me, like when I'm listening to you speak about this experience, there's there's so many policy rabbit holes we could go down. We could talk about like, you know, what appears to teachers as the traditional pathway from teacher preparation to being in the classroom to moving in administration and the fact that like you totally subverted that and found the joy and the love in teaching and continuing to remain in the classroom even as you became a leader in your school. But then I think there's like this other important side of it here, which is like that we often forget about the relational trust that is so important. And it's important between teachers and administrators. It's important between peer to peer, thinking about that moment when you went to another teacher in your school and said like, I can't do this alone. I need help in having that relational trust, but also about the kids. And that to me, and I don't want to speak for your experience, but to me, you know, that's where we often lose sight in our in our journeys is like we're so focused on growing ourselves that we forget that moment where we need to build that trust and that understanding between ourselves and looking introspectively into ourselves and those that we're trying to help and to mm. serve. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And you can't, then the thing is you can't teach that. Whether it's in traditional certification or alternative cert programs, like you have to do it and, and realize what's gonna work for you. And it's tough because you are going to fail and you're gonna make mistakes and you're not going to gain the trust of all the students. But I think that you're right, like that is such, that's the hard part. And that's often the thing that's forgotten about the most um, because there isn't a textbook way of going about it because it's so different depending on where you're at and the students that you're dealing with and what their background uh, truly is. And especially with relationships with other teachers. Yeah. Yeah. There's a comment in here. Let's do it. Let's go live with this from uh, Dominique here. Yes, I agree. My black male students have actually been the most critical about how to implement what we are learning in class to what is happening in their communities. Relationship building is definitely the key. Thank you for speaking to this and reminding us to build a bridge with students. Bravo, Mr. Josh Elder. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's coming from a phenomenal educator himself who always puts relationships uh, at the forefront of what he does. So also bravo to, to him as well. Yeah, I think I, I love being in conversation around that because one of the things that I think comes out, you know, in how you went about building relationships with students, and I think Jacob's going to take us into the next questions around your journey here, but you know, we don't take a moment to recognize the importance of failure in mm -hmm. doing this work and allowing ourselves to fail and allowing our students at times to fail freely and openly and try again. And so much of that relational trust is built on giving people the space to live out their journeys and to often fail and get up and try again in them. And so I think like you modeling that and sharing that right now, like that's really sticking with me. And I think ties into like what happens next and where you go next. Yeah. And yeah, this is, this is an interesting bridge over to the next part of your journey. You, you moved to South Africa. Did, did you ever imagine you would go there when you initially lived there or, um, and um, you know, yeah. tell us yeah. about what unfolds while you're there. Yeah, I mean, so short answer, no. Um, again, growing up like where there were hardly any neighbors, um, had no idea like what existed out in the world. I will say I had an amazing opportunity in, I think it was 11th grade, 10th or 11th grade, I always forget about it. Uh, but I had the opportunity to do an exchange program uh, to go to Spain. Uh, and shout out to the most amazing uh, Spanish teacher I had in my life, Senora Herb, if she's watching. Um, but that really changed my kind of outlook on life because honestly, growing up in rural America, I didn't know what was out there because you don't want to watch the news as a kid, even though like my grandma constantly had it on like Peter Jennings or whomever it probably was on ABC at the time. But I just didn't know what existed. And so, but that trip opened my eyes. I was like, wow, there's so much out there. Um, and so 
South Africa, no. Africa had always been as a continent, a place that I knew very little about because of our traditional education system. They don't teach you about it. So I had the opportunity while I was at KIPP to be exposed to a fellowship program that was providing opportunities for teachers to go over to South Africa uh, in the US summertime, which was the winter time for South Africa. But it was a reciprocal process where they would bring South African teachers over to the US. So again, making sure that it wasn't saying like the US has all the answers, wanted the South African educators to come over and help and shape how US teachers teach as well. Um, and so had the opportunity to do a two month kind of fellowship uh, there initially. And, uh, and I can talk more about this, but just that those two months there, I already knew that something was going to happen and change the trajectory of my life. And most likely it was going to involve me spending more time in South Africa versus the US. So um, while you're there, you, you fell in love and, and made a point to take a professional sabbatical um, and you started working in the school system there at this time. Mm -hmm. And then through, which I think is really just kind of awesome, is that um, eventually through community and people you knew, it, it sounds like it was a connection of a connection, kind of presented the opportunity that you were the person for, at least, you know, I, I'm hearing it in retrospect as a different person. So uh, t tell us about that story. Yeah. And, and what it's like founding a co-founding a school. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So I had negotiated basically after going to South Africa for two summers in a row, came back and said, you know what? Like, I'm going to move here. Uh, I'm going to just pause everything, pack up and create this opportunity to be in South Africa. And so I was able to kind of initially do a two year sabbatical to move to Cape Town uh, and be and basically be a science teacher at a school that I had been working with during the fellowship, um, teaching chemistry, physics, and all aspects of science uh, in a high school um, uh, that was serving uh, um, uh, historically uh, disadvantaged communities in the township populations, for those of you that know about South Africa, especially post-apartheid South Africa and the townships there and was gonna do two years to teach. Uh, and thought, literally, I would do my two years and then I'd come back to the US, pick up my life, go back to the charter school world and get into leadership. But those two years flew by before I knew uh, what had happened. And uh, I wasn't ready to, to go back. Um, and so starting to question what's next, because every two to four years, I seem to get this itch about, okay, what am I gonna do? So the two years, I knew I didn't wanna go back. Um, and for the first time, and you mentioned this, for the first time, I, it wasn't me proactively looking for something, but someone kind of was looking for me now that I, I realize it, but had the opportunity, uh, there was a connection through a friend um, that was working at an organization doing a lot of international education work across the world. Um, and they connected me uh, to someone that was kind of leaving the consulting space and had headed up the social sector um, for a large, one of the, the major consulting firms uh, was heading up social sector across Africa and wanted to carry out his dream and vision of creating a new innovative model of education across Africa, uh, but starting it in South Africa. And so we were connected. I didn't know anything about this guy. I looked him up. I was like, okay, he seems legit. Um, sure, come watch me teach. Like my door, my classroom is an open door. You're gonna see the good, the bad, the ugly at all times. So I'm not gonna plan anything special for you. Just come on in. Um, and at this time, he, there was nothing about the school or the network that he wanted to build mm -hmm. other than him. And I remember this, we went for coffee and he was like doodling on a napkin. Um, and this tells you how naive I was again. And like listening to him and his conviction, I was like, sign me up. What do I need to do? Like, I want to be a part of this. You sound so passionate. I, I would love to join you. Little did I know what I had signed up for was actually to be a co-founder and the chief academic officer and the opportunity to create a network of schools from scratch. So draw upon my experience, be able to travel the world and look for the best and most innovative aspects of teaching across the world and then contextualize that with my South African teaching experience over the years for what would be best for students. Um, and again, I had no idea. I was just like, sure. I thought I was just gonna be a part of a team, had no idea the team was actually the three of us and we were gonna do all aspects of this. 
um, but jumped at that opportunity and left Cape Town to go to Johannesburg, where we were able to basically build a network of schools from the ground up with no playbook other than our own playbook of what we thought innovative kind of student-centered learning should look like. I, one of my favorite pieces of this story that uh, is very, very appropriate for the LinkedIn part of this stream is you were saying that uh, you, you develop your concept, you guys are working on it, and then you were going to the malls and directly soliciting parents about their educational experiences. Um, and there's a piece of that that I think was um, both the uh, the tenacity of a salesman and these these other MBA types, but maybe something else that was culturally acceptable to have those conversations. Maybe the conversation around education was more open to parents being solicited about this. But what, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hilarious. I love when I get these Facebook memories that pop up to remind me of what that was like. But literally, we are in like these busy malls. We are hula hooping. We are bouncing basketballs. Anything to bring attention to us. Uh, three guys in the middle of a mall. Um, me trying to practice my basic Zulu and is it Tosa. Uh, but just trying to get parents to come talk to us, to just open the door and establish that trust to say, look, I know I'm an American, but I've been teaching here in South Africa. I'm sure you are loving where your school, where your kid is at in school, but let me tell you about what's possible. And maybe you haven't even realized what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine some parents loved it. Some parents didn't even want to come close. <laughs> right. Like, you know what, your words are great, but you need to show me what this looks like. And I think doing that allowed us to realize that we can be great salesmen, but we've got to actually show it in action. And that was the true challenge, that we could dream big, we could have these fancy PowerPoint decks that look amazing, we could like wine and dine you and schmooze you and tell you this is what it's gonna look like. But as a parent, which we have kids, and I'm sure you can relate to this, Jacob, like you wanna know what is it gonna look like for my kid to actually be at the school? Like, what is the experience going to be? Tell me what's going to happen uh, and, and show it to me. Uh, and so that was the true test for us was to then translate all of these promises and all these big ideas that we had. What does it actually look like on the day to day for the kids? And mind you, we're doing all this and we don't even have a school. We didn't have a building. We didn't have a location. We didn't have any of that. All of this stuff is happening in the background as we're trying to convince people about our model. So it was the craziest time of my life, but probably the most exciting and rewarding time of my life. I love what you said here um, about the possibility of the possible and the potential of the possible and showing that to people and in the way that like your eyes are being opened at the same time about what is possible for you, you're also trying to help other people see what is possible for them and pull from like all these experiences you've had and all the resources you have to do that. I want to drill in a little bit to what you were feeling at this moment. And, um, you know, we talked about beforehand, you were working with consultants. I come from a consulting background. I, as you are as well, are well aware of the, the very prestigious traditional pedigrees. We talked about this in CeCe's interview, the, the Harvard mentality um, of the consulting world, quite frankly. Um, and this apparent to some, I disagree, but the stark divide between education and business hmm. and really wrestling with this challenge. How did that feel for you? Where did this take you? Yeah, I mean, honestly, this was the first time I felt that. So with everything else I've done being in the education world, everyone comes from pretty similar backgrounds and you don't really talk about where you went to school and things like that. It's all about the students, right? But it wasn't until I started getting into this world of starting a school and realizing so many other people didn't have the education background, they had the business background, and then talking to investors and talking to others and realizing, like, if I hear no offense to any of those schools, but if I hear these names that we all know, if I hear them one more time, I'm going to scream. What I didn't start understanding and realizing was the level of imposter syndrome that I was at was starting to increase because I was like, wait a minute, like I went to Longwood. I'm no, nobody even heard of that. My master's at the time then was also at Virginia Commonwealth, another state school. No one had heard of that. Um, and so I was just like, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Like 
I, I don't have the business background. I don't have that pedigree, right? Like I'm the fir I'm first gen uh, college. Like what am I doing in these spaces? And really started to have some freak out moments and had to really think, you know what? Yeah, I didn't go to Harvard or Stanford, but you know what? I have my experience. I have my degrees. I have my lived experience and I'm here because of that. And so really had to, I think someone that does a great job, if you watch Insecure um, and Issa Rae's character, those pep talks in the mirror of like really like pumping yourself up and realizing, you know what, like you, you deserve to be here. And that's hard, but it did allow me, as I was encouraging myself to say, you, you are meant to be here and you can do this. I, there was a battle though for me that I hadn't experienced because being a part of something, starting something from scratch, this was also the first time that I wasn't just in the pure education side of the business. I was now on the business model of education. And that's such a different beast. And that was a beast that I was scared of, that existed, but I didn't know about until we started having these conversations about the business model, like the financial costs, like what's the price we're gonna set for the schools, and the whole like bums and seat mentality that exists when you operate these types of networks. And I was just like, this is scary. And A, I don't know if I wanna be a part of this because I'm like, wait a minute, if we're making decisions about what's better economically or what's better for the students. And mm -hmm. my personal ethos is like, I always wanna make choices what's best for my students and the families. Mm -hmm. But I also realized I didn't know a lot of the, the financial side of things. And so mm -hmm. I started wrestling with this like question again, what do I need to do to be well-rounded? If I wanna run something by myself and create my own entity, like what do I need to do? Do I get experience and maybe go do something else and just intentionally focus on the kind of business finance side of things in education? Or do I kind of have this midlife quarter life crisis wherever I was in my lifetime, do I go back to grad school again? Um, and do I intentionally push myself outside of my comfort zone, which is education, but it's also my passion. But do I try to focus on something that's going to give me the specific skill set that I feel I need to work on and develop in order to allow me to unlock additional kind of possibilities in life? Yeah, I so that that business versus education, passion divide. I just want to for all the people that are out here considering whether or not they need to go to grad school. I want you to know that you do not need to go to grad school. Um, your life experience is valuable and that's out there. And also we do have this tension, this world where we live in that those letters behind your name often mean something and can unlock doors. And we're going to, we're going to do a whole series at some point. On and I, I want to add to that also, if you're considering an instant MBA and, um, something else, maybe look deeper into the something else. Right. And so, you know, Josh, one of the things that we talked about in preparation for today was you're debating between the MBA and the policy schools. Uh, and you ultimately decided on SIPA, um, which I find fascinating because you actually did do a lot of management courses hmm. in that and a lot of finance courses and got the quantitative side um, in this program where you could like pick and choose what you wanted to do. What did that what did that mean to you? What ultimately swayed you to taking what was ultimately a very liberal arts approach to addressing the concerns and the gaps that you wanted to fill for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I definitely echo the the sentiment like if you're weighing options, do your research. You don't have to go to grad school, so I also want to put that out there. Um I, this was what I thought was my kind of best choice and route. Um, but I think on the MBA side where I, again, and I hadn't even thought about an MBA until I was in these circles uh, because everyone that was leaving these schools had done an MBA program. What I quickly realized for me personally was that what I wanted to develop was not going to be in an MBA program, uh, especially in traditional MBA programs where the courses and the things that you were going to get were not of interest to me. Uh, the network, sure, but the other stuff, no. I wanted a program that I could specifically almost create and pick and choose from a menu to say, you know what? Like, I'm really curious about econ, but I don't wanna go too deep, but I wanna have enough knowledge. I wanna beef up my quantitative chops, so I wanna be able to take 
uh, quant and understand regressions and p-value and all that like great stuff that we can geek out on. Um, uh, you know. <laughs> and then, but I also want to do stuff that I'm excited about. And so that's where the policy piece came in. Um, mm -hmm. Taking management, how do I become a better leader and a more effective leader? And I knew for myself that I didn't want to be in the education space. So I, I didn't look into any of the educational policy schools because I knew in a traditional policy school program, I could take classes in the education space. Again, pick and choose what I thought was best. And so for me, ended up um, at SIPA and was able to really craft and create my own two year journey of taking courses uh, all over the place. I mean, we spent a semester in the law school together doing an amazing program. Um, and so for me, I knew that's what I wanted and the program that I picked allowed for me to do yeah. that. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna call out that program that we did because I think it speaks to you know, what Jacob was speaking to before around like a sort of mixed approach to studying and pulling what's best for you and what you've just been speaking about too, Josh. So we, we did a program at Columbia Law called the Center for Public Research and Leadership um, which shaped a lot of our careers actually after that. And um, both of us ended up working for our client at that time was the New York City Department of Ed. We worked for them after, I still work for them. Um, but I that program had a specific recognition and awareness that all disciplines were necessary and all perspectives were necessary to bring to these hard intractable social policy issues that we were going to solve, that we needed the law students and the MBA students and the public health students and the social workers and the ed policy and the international policy and affairs. We needed all of those people in a room together working on these different projects for these different clients in order to have all the perspectives needed and the knowledge needed to solve these problems. Um, and what I'm hearing from you is that like actually really reflected the journey that you had been on and the experiences that you had collected and who had you, you had been working with mm -hmm. and that you wanted to see more of that and what you were doing for yourself. So made that choice. Yeah, no, absolutely. Such, such a great, I mean, experience and program because again, the exposure to people from all walks of life, uh, A, it reignited my passion for education, but it was just really, I think, such a great experience to hear how others viewed problems and created solutions that were just sometimes very similar to the way I was thinking or very different. Um, and we can both attest to that many of times having discussions and debates. Yeah. So I wanted to sh shift gears as we're, we're heading into the seventh inning. Um, what do you do now? Yeah, so uh, currently I work for, uh, I'm the Director of Grants Management at uh, organization, the Siegel Family Endowment, which is a family foundation based here in New York City. Uh, that kind of our primary focus in terms of our philanthropic work uh, centers around kind of this big question for us, which is how do we kind of understand and shape the impact of technology on society? And we do that through various ways of grant making and research kind of centered on learning infrastructure uh, and workforce. And it sounds like once more, you are deeply embedded in an organization taking a very interdisciplinary approach to problem solving. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think that that's actually a really important note to end on before Jacob and Josh take us into the rapid fire. And um, what sticks out for me at that moment is that, you know, there is often a trope in education around educators, you know, and I, I work, I do this for a living now, finding opportunities for educators to stay in the classroom to continue to influence students. But I also wanna say here, that I think your story, Josh, for me is an incredible opportunity to look at the importance of having educators everywhere in all the spaces where decisions are being made. And that particularly for men of color, you know, I know from conversations, we've had the sort of weight of making the decision to leave the classroom, knowing the responsibility that exists there, but also that your voice is so important in all of these spaces that are deciding where the money goes and what gets funded in those programs and that the collection of your experiences, including your education experience there, is so invaluable. Um, so I, I wanna shout out you for making that very brave choice to enter other spaces 
and, and for giving other people permission to do the same here. And yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, I think that honestly, those transitions have been the hardest. Leaving or making the choice to kind of put yourself first. And this, I think, is just so difficult as an educator, but it is the hardest thing to have to stand in front of a classroom or have conversations at the lunch table and tell your students that you're leaving. You, you don't realize at the time, but you know they're gonna be okay, right? They don't, they don't need you in order to survive, but those relationships you've built and the trust that you put, the time you built, the time you put in to build that trust, honestly, every single time I've had a transition, what's kept me up at night, made me sick to my stomach for weeks, was the dread of having to tell these students that I'm leaving. But the, the crazy part is, is that you're not, you're leaving physically, but you're not leaving them. I mean, I still have kids that I first taught and this will age me um, for all those wondering, oh, how old is he? My first well, year well, teaching well. was in 2005. I still have students to this day that I get messages from on Facebook. I mean, they're probably 30 plus years old now. They're getting married, they're having kids, but yet I'm still in that space with them. And I think that's what I had to realize that there's so much more in the world that I want to do. And I have to sometimes prioritize myself. Um, and at the same time, it's gonna mean taking risk and making choices uh, and have some people be disappointed, but overall knowing what the end goal is. And so you're exactly right. Like it is, it's hard, but we've all got to do it. Love that. Well, let's shift gears into rapid fire here, Josh. Uh, okay. Someone's making you a personalized playlist. What are the top three tracks that are on there for you? Uh, I mean, first track that's always going to be on there, uh, Crazy in Love, Beyonce, for people that know me, huge Beyonce fan. That doesn't go anywhere. Um, the other two, um, shout out Philly for this one, Jasmine Sullivan's Pick Up Your Feelings, number two song right now, listening. Oh, and, then, um, and this third one just emerged through like my YouTube rabbit holes that I go down. I hadn't, been I hadn't listened to a lot of uh, Billie Eilish, but All I Ever Wanted by Billie Eilish, I'm like That's listening cool. to it and like covers of it, but top three right now on repeat that I would have. I was listening to covers of that on uh, on like string quartets earlier this year, specifically that, uh, that Billie Eilish. Nice. It's funny we're listening to the covers there. Uh, um, something that you read lately that helped clarify your purpose? Yeah, I mean, two books that I'm reading uh, in quotations uh, because they've been sitting on my coffee table forever and they've been with me in my bag. But uh, one has been All Boys Aren't Blue uh, by George M. Johnson. Really interesting read, uh, kind of aimed at the kind of uh, teen, young adult population, but understanding and like affirming queer identity. Um, so definitely recommend that uh, really amazing book uh, in terms of his experience and background and just kind of coming to grips with who he is and being proud of that. And then the second one is I'm trying to like revitalize my morning. So I've been reading, I'm a sucker for a good self, self help book. Um, so the 5am club uh, by Robin Sharma, trying to like think about how I can like really revitalize uh, my morning time because you've always hear like the top people always use the time between like five and seven as their most productive. I don't know if that's true, but I'm trying to figure it out and see what I can do. Um, so those are the two things that currently are being read by me. All right, so uh, one last question. Um, what are your mantras that have guided you through your journey and that you would think would could be helpful to other people? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, two, I would say, one's kind of like traditional and one is like, because I used to watch a lot of junk reality TV and I actually put this on my classroom wall. Um, but one, I, th I mean, I think like, it's not necessarily a mantra, but I think what I've started to realize is like anything is possible. Um, and I didn't believe that always. I always, I thought there was like a, a limited cap for what was possible for me because of where I came from or what I chose to do and truly realizing as I'm getting older, anything truly is possible. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen, doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but anything can happen. Um, and then the second one, I think I got this from watching, I used to love watching Real Housewives. It was probably Real Housewives of Atlanta. 
And I can't remember who said it, but it was like, make your haters your motivators. And so I remember there was a period of my teaching time where I put this on my classroom wall um, that said, make your haters your motivators. And so I appreciate anyone that's ever hated or will hate um, because that will motivate me just to continue figuring out what's next for me in life. So thank you. Love it. Um, so everybody, Thank you again to joining us today. These episodes keep getting longer. We're gonna keep giving people space to tell their stories. That's what we're most committed to. So thank you for joining us for this. Josh, we cannot thank you enough for you sharing your story with us today. This was an amazing conversation. I can't wait to re-listen to it. I can't wait to share it with everybody through all of our networks. Y'all, if you want more of Josh, you can follow him on Instagram. He brings me all the black boy joy in the world. I'm at je underscore 15. Um, he's also on LinkedIn as Joshua Elder. So please follow him and keep up with his career. This man is doing incredible things. Um, I can't wait to see what he does next. Next week, we'll be talking to one of my professional mentors, Justin Douglas. Justin has a degree in natural sciences, but he's done so much beyond that. Um, he's got an extraordinary range of expertise from being a fellow at the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, um, a certified management consultant at PwC and IBM, where we met. Um, and most recently, he is an independent and celebrated business skills trainer and Gallup certified strengths coach. Um, he's also got a real passion for the environment. And I learned something from him every day about how to use uh, my position as an influencer for something bigger than myself. And um, so I'm thrilled to bring him on to the show. So Jacob, how can people find us next week? So if you want to find us next week, we are available on three different social media platforms. You can follow us here on LinkedIn through my profile, Jacob Sager. Search me up. I hope I've done all the right notes that I show up at the top, no matter who you are. You can follow us, facebook.com slash liberalartsmba. That's our page. We live stream there as well. Um, we also have a page on LinkedIn where you can follow us, Liberal Arts MBA, and you can also see us on our YouTube channel look up the Liberal Arts MBA. And please subscribe there, because uh, once we get 100 subscribers, we can change our URL. Guys, we're like the favorite chef at your favorite restaurant, bringing you something familiar, yet a little bit special every week, um, with a little bit of extra menu reading on the side. So we will see you next week. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jacob. Bye.